how the WRM was transferred to Earth. We have seen that primitive people believed in a supreme being whom we refer to as God. They believed in an evil adversary whom we call Satan because he tried to interfere with God's creation and with his creatures which inhabit the earth. The Bible tells us that, at a much later date in the world's history, the Hebrews thought of the heavens as concave, above a flat earth, supported on pillars, erected on foundations. 2 Sam 22-8 Prov 8-27-29 They believed that there are seven heavens inhabited by varying grades of superhumans, the highest Aravoth, being reserved for God. Saint Paul tells us he was caught up into the third heaven. 2 Cor 12-2 The scriptures don't tell us much regarding what happened in heaven after Lucifer and his fellow rebels had been cast out, nor are we told definitely why God decided to create this earth on which human beings decide their eternal fate. But God did give us an intelligence so we can reason things out for ourselves. If he hadn't done things in this way we wouldn't have been subjected to much of a test which is obviously designed to make each individual prove whether or not he honestly and sincerely desires to love God and serve him voluntarily for all eternity. Interesting light is thrown on this subject by several theologians who make reference to the fact that the cause of Lucifer's revolt against God could have been jealously aroused when God announced it to be his intention to create human beings and give them the chance and opportunity to develop into the highest ranks of the celestial beings. But it would appear more logical to assume that God came to his decision to create this world and populate it with human beings after Saint Michael had suppressed the Luciferian revolt. This reasoning opens a line of thought which could lead us to believe that God is infinitely merciful, as well as just, and therefore created a world, worlds, and populated it, or them with human beings because he did not hold all who had joined Lucifer in revolt equally guilty. It doesn't seem unreasonable to suppose that God decided to give those angels he judged to have been deceived into joining Lucifer, another opportunity to decide for themselves whether they wish to accept him as their God and supreme authority, or Lucifer. This theory could explain why there is a definite affinity of a spiritual entity with each individual body. We commonly refer to this entity as the soul, and associate it with our personal guardian angel. Carrying this theory to its logical conclusion, it would seem reasonable to suppose that God intended to place human beings on earth by a method of birth that prevented their having knowledge of other worlds beyond what he decided to reveal to our first parents personally, and to future generations through his prophets and the scriptures. We are told that he did walk with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, talking with them and explaining to them his holy will and his plan for the rule of the universe which he wanted to be established on this earth, as related in Genesis. This being true, our first parents had first-hand knowledge of God, his wishes, his plans and intentions for them in the future. He promised that if they respected his wishes and obeyed his commandments, they would, after a period of trial, rejoin him in heaven and live forever in perfect happiness. The scriptures confirm that part of primitive man's mythology which says God made living easy for them by providing for their needs. Then again, it is possible, as some theologians claim, that the correct explanation is that God created this world and inhabited it with human beings into whose bodies he breathed a soul in order to give them the opportunity to fill the vacancies left in heaven after Lucifer and those members of the heavenly host who joined in his revolt or cast into hell. They teach that God creates an individual soul for each individual body. If this is the case, then it is also probable that there are as many worlds as there are many choirs of angels 
and that each world is inhabited with human beings which compare an intelligence with the fallen angels they are designed to replace in heaven. If this is so, it does not seem unreasonable to suppose that our spiritual advancement, or deterioration, could be progressive as well as immediate, after the death of our mortal bodies. Millions of human beings believe in reincarnation. It could be that this belief originates with the knowledge that God's heaven consists of seven levels, that God's angels were made up of many choirs of varying degree, and that angels of lesser degree advance from one heaven to another. If this is so, it would appear that God intended human beings to exist in various degrees, and also intended that those on the lower plane could, by application, diligence, and attention to spiritual matters, advance themselves to higher levels on earth and higher degrees in heaven. This is what rugged individualism really means, and rugged individualism is what the enemies of God are determined to destroy. Obviously human beings can, and do, deteriorate spiritually until they reach the stage when they are engulfed in hell. This line of thought would offer some explanation to references made to limbo, purgatory, and the fact that Christ, after his resurrection, descended into some part of hell, where he released souls who were waiting their redemption. If God created human beings to fill the gaps made by the apostasies of the fallen spirits, then it is logical to assume he wants us to prove definitely that we wish to know, love, and serve him voluntarily for all eternity. If we develop this line of thought to its logical conclusion, then it is our spiritual condition, when we emerge from the struggle going on in this world for the souls of men, which will determine whether or not we are considered, page 17 Satan, Prince of this world, of the elect or of the damned reference in the scriptures to the immediate judgment at the moment of death, and the final judgment, when a definite division of the universe is made into heaven and hell, would indicate that there are intermediary places where souls could be tested further until they have definitely decided their eternal fate. There are a number of theologians who maintain that the elect of that human race are absorbed into the very hierarchy of the angels, into the ranks of the cherubim and seraphim, and all other orders. The theologians to whom I refer believe that the elect of that human race will not be only the outside fringe of the spirit world, but will, on the contrary, be the shining stars in every one of the spirit planes. This line of thought seems to be supported by St. Luke in chapter 20, verse 36. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. As Abbot and Scarvanier O.S.A. stated in his treatise on the angels, we are not concerned here directly with demonology, our scope is a more consoling one. Whatever height a fallen angel may have occupied in the scale of being, it is possible for the grace of God to raise man to that height, so that even the throne vacated by Lucifer himself may become the congenital inheritance of some holy soul. The learned abbot say further, it is possible for the grace of God to raise man to that height. I feel it would be better to say, the grace of God, used as he intends it to be used, can enable man to raise himself to such a height of spiritual perfection that it is possible for a human soul to occupy the vacancies left by the highest of the fallen angels. Every living soul knows that God did give us an intellect and the unrestricted use of our wills. If God hadn't intended to put us to a test, there would have been no sense in his allowing an adversary to oppose his plans, ridicule his wishes, and try to wean us away from God so that we could be possessed by Lucifer, the king of the empire of darkness, whom we commonly term the devil. Study of the opinions expressed by early Christians, and later by both Catholic and non-Catholic theologians, provides evidence which supports the reasoning set forth above. 
we find that several make reference to the fact that Lucifer and his followers express the lustful desire to have sexual relations with, and physical control over, the bodies of human beings God planned to create. Quite obviously they could have developed such desires only as the result of their rebellion against the supreme authority of God the Creator in order that they might foul up his plan to have human beings fill the gaps their rebellion had caused in the choirs of angels. Several early Christian theologians believe that the fallen angels lusted for the people of this world. St. Augustine claimed that the perverted and depraved interpretation of sexual relations adopted by the human race at the instigation of Satan, are contrary to God's purpose and intention. He calls this concupiscence. It would therefore seem logical to suppose that if concupiscence is contrary to God's will it was introduced by Satan to help further the Luciferian conspiracy upon this earth. The above opinions are based on the authority of the Book of Enoch. But these opinions have been ruled in error by the more modern theologians. St. Thomas and the decree of the Council of Trent claim that because all angels, those who remained loyal and those who defected from God, are pure spirits, it is impossible for them to lust or have sexual relations with human beings. Again, on the other hand, there is evidence in the records of exorcism, practiced by ordained ministers of the Christian religion, which claim that victims released after having been possessed by devils, claim they had been physically possessed sexually. Be that as it may, we know that God did create this earth. He did inhabit it with human beings. We are told that we are made in his own image and likeness. Because there are so many degrees of bodily form and shape, a human being's likeness to God must of necessity relate to its spiritual entity, which we call the soul. The scriptures support this conjecture. They tell us that until our first parents defected from God, and chose to accept the advice of Satan, their bodies shone like the sun because they were illuminated with the light of sanctifying grace. This spiritual illumination departed with the committing of what we term original sin. But whatever happened in this regard, it is definitely established that our mortal bodies have their spiritual entities. To believe otherwise is to be atheistic. We now come to the point in the world's history where God's adversary is named Satan. He caused Eve to defect from God. She afterwards persuaded Adam to join her in rebellion. Without stressing the point of how Satan deceived Eve into defecting from God, it must be apparent to most thinking people that perversion of sex definitely entered into the deception. By perversion of sex we mean that Satan taught Eve how to use sexual relations to gratify animal passion and carnal desires, Study of this phase of the Luciferian conspiracy would indicate that God intended sexual intercourse to be a holy union between a man and his wife, entered into for the purpose of creating another human being into whom God could infuse a soul because he desired to have an opportunity to fill one of the vacancies left in heaven as the result of the Luciferian rebellion. There must be some merit to this line of thought. Otherwise there would not be such a clash of opinions regarding the use of contraceptives in so-called planned births. If there isn't merit in this point of view, why is it that those who work to prevent God's plan for the rule of creation being established on this earth are secretly determined to replace God's plan for the reproduction of the human race by artificial insemination practiced on an international scale? The teaching of Christ in many scriptural quotations tell us that God made human beings greater than the angels inasmuch as he gave them the power to reproduce their kind according to his fool. The waste of human, page 18 Satan, prince of this world seed is condemned over and over again. Every sensible human being knows that because God is God, i.e., the supreme being, creator of heaven and earth, the universe, he could, 
if he wished, have prevented Lucifer interfering with his plan to create terrestrial worlds and human beings, but if he had done so, we would have been subjected to no real test. Without wishing to be presumptuous, it seems reasonable to suppose that God obtains his pleasure from his marvelous creation out of love and fidelity given him by those, both angelic and human, who remain staunch, loyal, faithful and true, despite all the evil machination of the devil, and his angels, who wander through this world, and probably others, seeking the ruin of immortal souls. In order to understand these things we must understand the facts concerning spirit tutelage. The word tutelage is used to mean guardianship and or instruction. Spirit tutelage is a divine ordinance. It permits man to be influenced by good and evil spirits who have the power to put thoughts into our minds. Temptations are what we term evil thoughts. Temptation by evil spirits is not a divine ordinance, it results from what theologians call the permissive providence of God. If the human race were not subject to evil influences as well as good, there would be no purpose in God having given us an intellect and free will. The intellect enables us to analyze the thoughts which enter our minds. We make a decision. Then, by use of our free will we make our bodies put the decision of the mind into action. The most frequent question asked by people in all walks of life concerning this very important matter is, if God is good, then why does he permit evil? If God loves the human race, why does he permit even innocent people to suffer the tribulations of wars, revolutions, sickness, etc.? Experiences in two wars and three revolutions taught me the answer to these questions. First I believe that it is God's intention to fill the gaps in heaven resulting from the fall of angels of many degrees from grace with beings, including human beings, who positively and definitely prove by the nature of their prayers and works, the manner in which they deal with temptation, and the way in which they stand up under conditions of physical, mental, and spiritual stress, that, regardless of what happens to them on this earth, they still wish, with a burning and constant desire, to voluntarily love and serve God for eternity. This belief is justified in Matt 10 28, Luke 12 4, 2 Kings 7 4, P.S. 44 22, etc., etc., I base this explanation on the further belief that God, being the creator of the totality of the universe, can derive happiness only from the love, loyalty, devotion, and service given him voluntarily by his creatures. He intends that we prove to him that we have definitely and irrevocably made this decision before he allows us to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, we decide our own eternal fate. St. Paul's text, 1 Cor. V. 3, says, Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things of this world? I take this to indicate that those human beings who come out of this earthly test, with God's colors flying, will be chosen to pass judgment on the fallen angels who use their powers to inspire us with evil thoughts and deceive us into doing evil things. The fact that the elect put aside temptation and refuse to be deceived, even though the agents of the devil work great wonders, prove they have one spiritual domination over the forces of evil. They will be permitted to exercise this domination on the day of final judgment. In 1918, when I was helping remove rubble, resulting from a German air raid on West Hartle Pool, England, to rescue an infant whose cries came from the dark interior of the collapsed building, I learned the answer to the second half of the question. As we worked I heard the anguished mother cry, If God is all good, how can he permit such evil? How can he allow innocent little children to suffer? Why does he punish me so? I have tried to love him and serve him as I worked 
The answer came to me. Half an hour later we reached the baby. It was alive and uninjured. It was lying alongside a grandmother on a mattress on the floor inside a cupboard made by enclosing the space under the stairs which led from the ground floor to the upstairs rooms. The grandmother was dead. When the baby was placed in its mother's arms, I asked her if I might accompany her. Friends standing by had offered her shelter. She gave me permission. Over the cup of tea, the provision of which is an absolute necessity in time of joy or sorrow with the English people, the mother hugged her infant to her breast and murmured, Oh, God, forgive me. How could I have doubted your infinite goodness? I placed my hand on her arm and said, God doesn't will that we, his creatures, suffer the abomination of war. Wars are a punishment humanity afflicts upon itself because the majority have obstinately and persistently refused to do his will, obey his commandments, and put his plan for the rule of the universe into effect upon this earth. We punish ourselves because we permit Satan to remain, prince of this world. This line of reasoning I honestly believe to be the truth. The incident I record here happened in April, 1918. Another world war and many revolutions have been fought since. The WRM is directed at the top by the synagogue of Satan to further the secret plans of the high priests of the Luciferian creed. It is they, human beings, diabolically inspired by the spiritual forces of darkness, who foment wars and revolutions and in doing so they confirm the words spoken by Christ himself when he said of the SOS, Ye are sons, of the devil, whose lusts ye shall do. He was a murderer from the beginning, etc. Yes, the devil has been and still is a murderer. Wars and revolutions are his means of committing mass murder. In my opinion we commit a terrible sin when we even think that God wills wars, revolutions, and other forms of abominations. God did not wish our, page 19 Satan, prince of this world first parents to defect from him. They did so of their own free will and accord. God did not will that human beings terminate this earthly existence by the death of our mortal bodies. When Adam and Eve sinned they suffered the loss of sanctifying grace. That automatically involved the death of their mortal bodies, contrary to God's will and his original intention. The same conclusions are correct if applied to physical and mental ailments. While human beings ate meat, fish, fowl, fruits, nuts, seeds, and vegetables as intended by God, they lived healthy lives, and they lived to a ripe old age. If they died naturally, they died of old age, the gradual wearing out of the body's vital organs. It was not until the human race departed from God's will, in respect to diet, and substituted the devil's brew, consisting of food, drinks, and drugs which satisfy gluttony, the carnal appetite, and arouse lustful thoughts and sensual desires, that ailments of the flesh shorten our lifespan and cause physical diseases and mental suffering. Don't take my word for this. In the scriptures Romans 6.23 tells us, The wages of sin is death. Why do those who plot our subjugation force us to eat denatured foods in this day and age, if it isn't to weaken us mentally as well as physically? There is another fact that concerns the WRM being transferred to this earth in the Garden of Eden. The devil, Lucifer, Satan, or however you wish to designate the secret evil power on this earth, which constitutes the adversary to God's will, occupied this earth before God created Adam and Eve. Satan was here and ready to tempt Eve, and through her, Adam, when both were still in a state of innocence, and enjoying the presence and friendship of God, man's sin strengthened the hold the devil had on this world. It did not create it. 
theologians as a rule accept this as an insoluble mystery. I would like to point out that this fact indicates that this world was, and still is, part of the section of the universe controlled by Lucifer, the part we term hell. There seems to be a lot of truth in some old saying, which dates back into antiquity, this is hell upon earth. Human beings still have the opportunity to reunite with God, if they so desire, but the vast majority don't seem to do very much about it. The next question is this. Are Lucifer and Satan one and the same supernatural being? For reasons beyond my own comprehension, the accepted idea of most theologians is that Lucifer and Satan are one. Yet the same theologians agree that there is evidence for believing that there are several principalities in hell, each ruled by a supernatural being who is subordinate to Lucifer. Is it unreasonable to suppose that Satan is a different being who defected from God at the time of the heavenly revolt led by Lucifer? Is it unreasonable to suppose that there is a certain degree of truth in the teachings and doctrines of those who expound the Luciferian ideology on this earth? Even admitting that an angel, by reason of being a pure spirit, regardless of whether it is good or evil, isn't confined to any geographical limitations, and can use its influence for good or evil in a dozen different places in less time than is used in the twinkling of an eye, it still seems reasonable to suppose that Lucifer is king of all that part of the universe we term hell, and Satan is one of his princes. Does not Christ himself designate Satan as prince of this world? The conditions existing upon this earth would seem to indicate it is part of hell rather than a part of heaven. If this world is part of hell, then it is reasonable to suppose that the decision we make here is final. That may explain why he visited here as he did another part of hell before his resurrection. He redeemed us, but whether we accept his redemption or reject it, it is our own business. Be that as it may, the fact remains that the Luciferian doctrines what the Holy Scriptures neglect to say on this important subject. Christ made it very clear that Lucifer is the father of lies, and that Satan uses lies and deceits to achieve their diabolical purpose. Is it unreasonable to suppose that Lucifer has inspired those who have directed his conspiracy here on earth to tell only a little of the truth? If this line of thought isn't logical, then where did the old saying originate that half a truth is more dangerous than a whole lie? If Lucifer was at the very top of the highest heavens, and nest in beauty, power, and glory to God himself, and if the Luciferian mythology, the eldest son of God and older brother of Saint Michael, is based on truth, then the many and varied pieces of evidence concerning the transfer of the Luciferian conspiracy onto this earth, given previously, fall into a place and provide an exceptionally clear picture of this phase of the conspiracy. There are volumes upon volumes of writings which indicate and or prove that Freemasons are taught that the origin of their secret society dates back to the time of the building of the pyramids. There are just as many volumes that prove that adepts of the Grand Orient Lodges and Councils of the New and Reformed Polydian Rites are taught that their form of masonry has continued since the fall of Eve. They claim that her seduction by Satan produced Cain and that Cain founded the Synagogue of Satan. This is the teaching which requires members of the lower degrees of the Grand Orient and Polydian Rite to become Satanists. It is a strange coincidence that most men who stoutly protest they are 100% for God and refuse to accept the idea that Satan is different and subordinate to Lucifer, are supported in this opinion by those who openly acknowledge their allegiance to Satan. Evidence will be produced to prove that it is only when a confirmed Satanist in the Grand Orient or Polydian Rite is initiated into the High Priesthood of the Luciferian Creed that he is told the full secret, and required to accept its creed, 
which says, Lucifer is God the equal of Adonai, Adonai and the worship of Satan is therefore a heresy. General Albert Pike is accepted as the greatest modern authority as far as Luciferianism is concerned. As head of the Paladian Rite, he wrote a letter of instruction dated July 14, 1885, and sent it to the heads of the, page 20 Satan, Prince of this world 26 councils located throughout the world. In this letter he not only confirmed the belief that Satan is subordinate to Lucifer, but stated that Lucifer is God, the equal of Adonai, and added that Lucifer is the God of light, the God of good, who struggles for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and all evil. Pike has been built up by the press of the United States to the point that most Freemasons consider him one of their most illustrious brethren, and one of America's greatest patriots. But research reveals that Pike lived a double life. Secretly he was a worshipper of Lucifer. Between 1859 and 1889 he rose to be head of the high priests of the Lucifer Ian Creed. Lower degree Masons are taught to believe different statements regarding the source of their secret society. The fact is that, when they are initiated into a higher degree, they are told something entirely different by those conducting the initiation, telling them that as they advance to the higher degrees, they are admitted deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the craft. Not one Mason in a thousand even suspects that, far away above the Scottish Rite of Blue Masonry, and beyond the reach of any except those carefully selected for admittance into Grand Orient Lodges and the councils of Pike's new and reformed Paladian Rite, Satanism is practiced. In these secret societies Satan is worshipped as God and Prince of this world, but above these satanic societies, specially selected members of the synagogue are initiated into the full secret which is the final truth as exemplified in the Lucifer Ian Creed, as we have just explained. The reader may ask, why a leaven this secrecy? The answer is that those human beings who have literally sold themselves to the devil, know that the final success of their diabolical conspiracy against God and his human race depends upon their ability to keep their identity and true purpose secret. This book is published to expose their secret and to rouse public opinion so that an end may be put to this conspiracy, and thus bring about the prophecies contained in Revelations, which say Satan shall be chained and returned to hell and remain there for one thousand years. In the International Lodges of the Grand Orient and Pike's New Paladian Rite, adepts are required to accept as truth that Masonry really originated with Cain. They are told that Satan, whom they name Ebilus, conferred on the human race the greatest benefaction possible when he defeated God's, Adunay's, plot to keep the knowledge of sexual behavior, and the secret of procreation, from our first parents. The initiates are told that Ebilus initiated Eve into the pleasures of sexual intercourse, and taught her the secret of procreation, and thus made her and Adam equal in power to God. The initiate is also told that, as the result of the sexual relationship Eve gave birth to Cain, who started the movement, Masonry, and put the Luciferian ideology into effect here as it is in that part of the celestial world over which Lucifer reigns. Thus, where the members of the lower degrees of the Scottish Rite are taught that Heron was the father of Masonry, those admitted to the highest degree are taught differently. Dot 7. Study of the Manichaean movement and doctrine informs us that in order to prevent God's plan to make Adam and Eve the first parents of his human race, Satan seduced Eve and possessed her, and was the father of Cain and Eve's first daughter also. The Manichaean doctrine teaches that Cain married his sister, and that the progeny of this union, incest, have perpetuated Satanism ever since. Without wishing to labor this point too heavily, it is of interest to point out that scripture relates there was something very displeasing to God about Cain's marriage. 
Cain also murdered his brother Abel, and Christ in his day castigated those of the synagogue of Satan as, Ye are sons of your father the devil, his lusts shall ye do. He is a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. John 8:44. The serpent is the name by which Satan is known in the Holy Scriptures. Reverend 22, Num. 21:9. The serpent is the symbol of Satanism in secret societies which worship him as prince of the world. Scriptures refer to Eve and the seed of the serpent. General 3:116. Therefore we may ask, where did the seed of the serpent come from? Paul said, in 2 Cor, that Eve had been unchaste with the serpent, Lucifer, devil, Satan. Lucifer means the bright and shining one. Right here is the origin of the seed of the serpent. In general 3.15 God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. In saying this to the serpent, Lucifer, devil, Satan, God stated that Lucifer would have a seed, just as physical as Eve's seed would be physical. In general 3.16 God said to Eve, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, which indicated plainly that her desire had previously been to another. In Cor. 11.23 Paul here was talking about, chastity, to present the Corinthians as a chaste virgin to Christ. In the very next verse, Paul said, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, Paul here affirmed that Eve did not present herself a chaste virgin to Adam. Remember, there is only one way for a virgin to lose her chastity. In general 4.1, Eve thought that Canaan was her promised seed, but later acknowledged that she was mistaken and that Seth, not Cain, was her promised seed, when she said, General 4.25, For God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. 7. Those wishing further information on this particular phase of the conspiracy should read the books listed elsewhere, particularly Coppin Albancelli's Le Drame Masconique, etc. Page 21 Satan, Prince of this world Cain and Abel were twins, General 434, for they became of age at the same time and presented their offerings on the same day. Abel was the son of Adam, but Cain was the son of Lucifer. Lucifer and his seed have been killers down through the centuries, and Christ accused them of having slain all the prophets from Abel to his time, Matt. 23.35. Lucifer begat a seed, as God said he would, 1 John 3.12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, lost his sexual desire outside the natural law of God. Therefore Christ himself seems to have confirmed that Satan was lustful and is father of the synagogue of Satan as those who are Satanists teach and believe. Satanists have always used sex bribery and the depravities and perversions of sex to obtain control of men and women they wish to use to further the secret plans of their diabolical conspiracy. Satanism makes a god of sex. They worship the human body because of its sexual abilities. When men and women prove they are unyielding to all other forms of devilish temptation, they often fall as the result of becoming involved in illicit relationships and perversions. Did not David commit abominable sexual crimes, including incest? Then, Christ also told us that the father of the synagogue of Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Who else could that person have been but Satan? Did he not inspire Cain, his son, to kill his own brother, Abel? Has murder not been the stock in trade of those who have comprised the synagogue of Satan ever since? What is revolution and war if not murder practiced on a mass scale? Another important fact concerning incest being used to start the synagogue of Satan on this earth is the practice of pagan kings who worship the devil. In order to perpetuate their line of succession, 
they insisted that their sons marry their own sisters. But regardless of what is right or what is wrong, the fact remains that when Christ did start his mission, he told us that the Luciferian conspiracy had reached the stage where Satan, as prince of this world, had obtained control over all those in high places. The words in general 4.15 seem to indicate that after Adam and Eve defected from God, he willed that what has happened since should take place. He said, Whosoever should slay Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. It would seem that after our first parents defected, God insisted that those who truly wished to love him and served him voluntarily for all eternity, out of respect for his infinite perfections, should prove their sincerity. Without the adversary and the synagogue of Satan, there would be no real test. The Holy Scriptures give us enough information to enable us to decide for ourselves which way we want to go. Satanism teaches that Jesus Christ is one and the same as Saint Michael, and is the younger brother of Satan. Satanism also claims that God sent Saint Michael to earth, in the form of Jesus Christ in order that he might end the Luciferian conspiracy here as he had previously done in heaven. Both Satanists and Luciferian adepts boast that Christ failed in his mission. They make the reacting of his defeat the major part in the celebration of the Black Mass. Pike revised and modernized the Black Mass and named his brainchild the Adonaiside Mass. The word Adonaiside means the death or end of God. The death of God was the primary purpose of N-I-E-T-Z-S-C-H-E-I-S-M.8 It would seem that because the enmity between Satan and Saint Michael started in heaven, and because Christ, while on earth, rejected the overtures of Satan to join him in rebellion against the absolute supremacy of God, the enmity has been carried out so that Christianity has been, and still is honeycombed with Lucifer Ian and or satanic cells. Since Christ first picked his apostles, these ancient yours always hide their true identity while they bore industriously from within. Today they are to be found disguised as modernists, weakening the various denominations so that they will be ready to collapse when those who direct the conspiracy at the top decide it is time to provoke the final social cataclysm. Pike explained what is intended to happen in a letter he wrote to his director, Marazzini of the WRM August 15, 1871. This letter is quoted elsewhere. It is catalogued in the library of the British Museum, London, England 9 and has been quoted from and referred to by dozens of authorities and students of the WRM, including Cardinal Rodriguez of Chile. See page 118 of the Mysteries of Freemasonry Unveiled, 1925. In English translation, 1957, that the Luciferian conspiracy has exist, and has had unbroken continuity since its very beginning, regardless of whether we take its beginning in the celestial world, or from the Garden of Eden, proves it to be of supernatural origin and direction. Nothing conceived in a human mind could be so perfect, so diabolical, so titanic in dimensions, or so utterly destructive as the Luciferian conspiracy, which today we call the World Revolutionary Movement, WRM. Every time an attempt has been made by ecclesiastical and or civic officials to expose Satanism as the inversion of God's plans and laws, and the antithesis of the Christian religion, the agent you're of the high priests of the Lucifer Ian Creed, who are located behind the scenes of all governments, both secular and ecclesiastical, have so far succeeded in turning the intended exposure into an actual and factual witch hunt. To prevent real eight C pages 346-7 of Satan, by Sheed and Ward, New York, 1951. 9. The Keeper of Manuscripts recently informed the author that this letter is not catalogued in the British Museum Library. 
It seems strange that a man of Cardinal Rodriguez's knowledge should have said it was in 1925. Page 22 Satan, Prince of this world Satanists and dedicated Lucifer Eons from being exposed and punished. The synagogue of Satan and the high priests of the Luciferian creed, who control the SOS have always succeeded in throwing an ample number of substitutes into the hands of the investigators, who provided the executioners with enough victims to satisfy the outraged feelings of the princes, both religious and secular, and the bloodlust of the angry mobs. Until recently, these substitutes were accused of being witches and or sorcerers who worship the devil. Believers in God will be next. Between 1486 and 1675, 32 ecclesiastical measures were taken against Satanism, and between 1532 and 1682, 149 witches and or sorcerers were burned, 78 banished from their countries and 124 punished in other various ways. These measures and punishments affect Americans. They were accused of being Satanists and furthering the Luciferian conspiracy against Christianity. Public attention was thus kept centered upon unimportant victims, most of whom had been charged or betrayed by the high officials who kept their own identity with the Luciferian conspiracy, secret.10, the scriptures and writings of inspired men since the advent of Christ are full of incidents of demonic possession of individuals, but except in the collect, read by priests celebrating the Mass on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, one is unable to find anything very definite on the diabolical contagious, diabolical contagion or the devil's influence on the human masses. This is rather extraordinary because if wars and revolutions are, as I maintain, the destructive force being used by those who direct the WRM to eliminate all other forms of government and religion, then the devil's influence on the GOEM human masses is far more powerful, seductive and deceptive than is the possession of an individual. There can be no logical denial that the devil, through his earthly agent your can and does influence the thinking of the masses in order to produce evil mass results including wars and revolutions. We refer to the manner the secret powers of evil have of using propaganda and mass psychology to serve their diabolical purposes. 10 C pages 346 7 of Satan, by Sheed and Ward, New York, 1951, page 23 Satan, Prince of this World.